Actually, before we go to word problems, let's talk about polar form of vectors, which I didn't talk about yet, but we can talk about it right now. Now, if we're in two-dimensional space, that's the dimension we're used to working in and graphing in. So if you have a two-dimensional vector, you can write in polar form. Three dimensions, a little more tricky because you get two angles. Uh, but we're going to stick the polar form in two dimensions. So this is your vector v. And if we call this x and y, to measure v in to measure v in polar form, we're going to get a theta and a radius. And we get a theta and radius the same exact way we did before. So we could write v is in diamond notation xy or ij notation xi plus yj whichever of the two notations you want to go with. Now polar form, how does that work? We have our good friends, the convert from polar to rectangular equations. Some of the first things you learned as well, just divide by r, and you have the basically definition of cosine and sine. So those are definitely not new. I'm going to do something very easy, which is replace x by r cos theta and y by r sine theta. What scalar can I factor out? So there's an r in both pieces. So we're going to write this as r times cos theta comma sine theta. So this is written with a magnitude and a direction. And this is a polar form for a vector. So this is polar form in. This really only works in two dimensions. If you go up to three dimensions, uh, you need to do things a bit differently. But this is how to do polar form in two dimensions. Uh, in three dimensions, there is two types of polar forms. There's cylindrical form and there's spherical form. But for us in two dimensions, there's only one way to go, and that's the polar form we've been using. So this polar form is how we're going to uh, solve a lot of the word problems, is we're going to use polar form. This should feel exactly like polar form of points and pretty much exactly like polar form of complex numbers written not in the, this is closer to the, I think I call it a standard notation, or standard form, not the Euler form. So this is really close to the standard form. Uh, in fact, if we write it out in ij's, we have i cos theta plus j sine theta. The only difference is basically there's no i on the cosine term, and then the i is a different i next to sine. So it looks really similar. So that's an ij form. So we're going to use this idea for our, I think every word problem we're going to use this. So a ball is thrown with initial speed of 25 miles an hour. in a direction that is 30 degrees above the horizon. So find the velocity vector in both polar and rectangular form. So 
So there's our polar form. And we're going to find this velocity vector. All right, let's draw a picture. So a ball is thrown 30 degrees above the horizon. So we can choose which way the horizon is. Let's go ahead and make the horizon. Uh, we'll go to the right. And I want 30 degrees above the horizon. So that's 30 degrees right there. I could throw it the other way, and my x would just be negative instead of positive. Now, 25, what property is 25 with this vector? It's not the angle. We use 30 degrees for the angle. That would be the radius or the magnitude. So this vector right here, this is the velocity, the initial velocity velocity of the ball when it's thrown. So 25 is the radius or the magnitude. I think we use R right above, so we'll go with R here. And 30 degrees is theta. So in diamond notation, we get cos 30, sine 30 times 25. So that's polar form. How do we go to rectangular form? It's actually very easy. You evaluate cosine, evaluate sine, and distribute. So this is our polar form answer. So cos 30 is square root 3 over 2. Sine 30 is 1 over 2. And distribute your 25 in. So we have 25 square root 3 over 2, comma, 25 over 2. And this is rectangular form. And we'll put a box around both of these. So depending on what you're doing, one of these forms may be more useful than the other form. So any questions on your first polar form, rectangular form? It should feel exactly like what we did in the last few sections. So our next example, we're going to go the opposite direction, given, uh, we'll use u for this vector, given the vector u is 4i minus 4j. Find the direction angle and magnitude uh, and graph. So I'll give you one minute to graph, find the angle and the magnitude of this vector. Graphing should be the easy part.
So the radius should have been pretty easy to compute. I recommend use algebra to avoid arithmetic. So I see 4 squared plus 4 squared, which is 2 4 squareds. So 4 squared, square roots to 4. So there's just 4 squared root 2. I didn't have to do 16 plus 16 is 32, and then potentially make a mistake going that way. So this way, you avoid a lot of the problems you might run into. Now, the angle, if you have good geometrical sense, you already know the angle, because you're going the same amount down as you're going over. So it's halfway, so I can just write pi over 4 if I have a good idea about uh, that I went the same amount over as I went down. If you're more into the uh, memorizing tangent values, you know tangent theta is y over x, which reduces to negative 1. But negative 1, I could write negative 1 over 1, but those are not points on the unit circle. So the points on the unit circle, I'm going to divide the top and the bottom by square root 2, because I know 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2 is a point on the unit circle. The only problem is I decide which one's negative. They're both equal to negative 1, both of these fractions. But I see that my original negative was on the y. So this is the one I should be using, not that one. My original negative is on the y. And now I have to figure out where is this value on the unit circle. And the answer is it's right down here. 1 over square root 2, negative 1 over square root 2, which is that negative pi over 4. So that's all we had to do, get the angle. So we graphed it, we got the angle and the magnitude. Well, maybe I should call it magnitude. So next problem, an aircraft uh, maintains a constant airspeed of 500 miles per hour headed due south. The jet stream is 80 miles per hour in the northeastern direction. And we're going to assume that northeastern is exactly between north and east. So it's going to be directly between north and east not some other angle in that quadrant. And we want to figure out what is the, so find the velocity vector of the airplane. So that's VA, we want to get VJ, the velocity of the jet stream. the velocity vector of the jet stream. And Vt this is the total total velocity. Oops, that should be an I. of the airplane relative to the ground. And last, we'll find S, which is the V 
the ground speed of the aircraft. So some of these vectors are going to be very easy to get. Some of them are a little more difficult. When we get total velocity, what we're going to do is think about how the airplane velocity and the jet stream velocity interact. And if that's a little hard to envision, you can think about a leaf floating through a stream. And so the stream will move it, and then maybe the leaf gets some air on it and moves it um, another direction. And so you end up having to basically add up the two, and we'll see this uh, happen. So let's draw the two vectors out for the airplane and the jet stream. And we need more space. So we have airplanes headed due south. So VA is 500 due south. Now, whenever you have a vector going down the axis, I like to make it extra bold. And we'll call this VA. And that's supposed to be 500 in length. So because we're going down on the y-axis, I'll label that as negative 500. And the jet stream is 80 northeastern. So northeast, that's first quadrant. And we're right in the middle of the first quadrant. And this is VJ of the jet stream. And I will label 80 is going to be our magnitude right there. And we are directly in between the eastern and north, northern directions, or right between the positive x, positive y axis. So our theta will be either 45 degrees or pi over 4. So let's write out VA and VJ. So we have an x and a y component for VA. What is the x component for VA? Zero. So we got zero. So we're not going left and right. What is the y component? Negative 500. Negative 500. So the way I drew it out, it's going down 500. That's VA. VJ is a little more tricky. Do we know the x and y coordinates of VJ? Not really. We know the polar version, though. So let's write the polar version. So we're going to go with 80 times cos pi over 4 sine pi over 4. So with the pink marker, I'm going to draw out the total velocity. So if you think about what's happening, the airplane's flying south, it's going to be pushed a little bit north and east. So the overall, the airplane's going to go a little bit to the east. It also has a headwind, so the fact that the jet stream is blowing north is going to actually slow the airplane down a little bit. So the way we figure out the total is we add the two vectors together. So what's that going to look like? I'm going to, well, unfortunately, I have to draw right on top of this vector. And now that label looks like it's in the wrong spot. So this big vector is VA. This little pink vector I drew is a copy of VJ right there. So we're going to go VA plus VJ. And that total is going to be this vector right here. So that's VA plus VJ right there. So go down one vector and then across the other. So any questions on how we get to that vector right there? And we call it, I think we call this VT for total. So, whoa, that's a VI. It should be a T, VT. 
All right, so I'll just write VA and VJ their values. Why can I not add these together? Well, I, I can't add them together, but it's going to be very ugly. Forms. So they're different forms. Did I show you how to add in polar coordinates? <coughs> no, it's because you really can't. So we're not going to stay in polar, so we're going to go all to rectangulars. I actually can add these up without going to rectangulars, but it's going to look like 0 plus 80 cos pi over 4 plus 80 cos pi over 4, comma, negative 500, plus 80 sine pi over 4. So I can add them up. I just still have a cosine and a sine hanging around. So I can evaluate those pretty easily. Cos pi over 4 is 1 over square root 2. And actually, let's use the rationalized version, square root 2 over 2. I normally am very opposed to that. But I see we're about to multiply by 80. And this will make our numbers look a little better. So 80 over 2 is 40. Square root 2, comma. I'll put the positive part first. 40 square root 2 minus 500. So that's the total speed right there. Last part. So that's a to well, that's the total velocity, not total speed. So we know. VT right here, we drew a picture. VT, if we just redraw that, it's going to look something like that. That's VT. How do I get the speed from a velocity? So all speed is, is the magnitude of the velocity. So when you talk about your speed, usually it's just a number. And that is how fast you're going. And it doesn't depend on your direction. So if you turn your car, and you're on the highway, and your cruise control's on, your speed will be constant, even though your velocity vector will move a little bit as you turn. So you can maintain the same speed, but have her velocity vector changes going to be the same magnitude, but you're not always driving in the same direction. So all we have to do to get the speed is take the magnitude of our total velocity. So we want our ground speed. So we're just taking what's right above and 40 square root 2 squared plus 40 square root 2 minus 500 squared. It's tempting to leave it like this, but I'm going to expand it out a little bit. So 40 squared, who knows? I'm just going to write it as 40 squared. Square root 2 squared is easy. That's times 2. Plus, I'm going to foil out this second part right here. So we have 40 squared times 2 minus, there is an inside outside. So there's two of these terms of the product right here. Oh, man. So that is 40 times 500 is 20 with three zeros. Square root 2. plus 500 squared. So 
So add the first two terms together. 500, I don't know why I'm doing all this. I thought it was gonna be nicer. Even if I square those and add them together, it's still not going to be a nice number because that square root 2 is hanging around. That's not going to go away. All right, if we're going for web work, I would just leave the first answer. It is most likely to be correct. So we'll just circle that right there. That's good enough. If you're working on a quiz or final exam, don't spend time simplifying your answers. Just give me whatever. Uh, once you have no more variables, you're just down to numbers. Don't worry about squaring things, adding them together, and all that. So we'll go with that as our speed. Now if we check real quick, how can I take this initial velocity vector of the aircraft and get the speed? Find the magnitude. So what's the magnitude of this vector? So it's the magnitude of VA, which is square root 0 squared plus 500 squared. What does that reduce to? 500. So there we go. That is the speed of the initial speed of the airplane, which matched what we uh, got in the problem. So speed doesn't have a positive or negative. So the last problem is a static equilibrium. So what in the world is static equilibrium? So static, what that means is not changing. Equilibrium uh, basically means everything is equal. So everything is equal and not changing, which uh, we're going to look at forces uh, with force vectors. And static equilibrium means the sum of all of the forces add up to zero. Let's be a little more careful of all the force vectors. So if you add up vectors, you get another vector. So when I say the sum of all the vectors add to zero, do I mean the zero number or the zero vector? So we're adding up vectors, so we're going to get a vector. So that better equal the zero vector, not the zero number. So make sure you make that zero bold. That's a zero vector. Usually, we're going to be in two-dimensional space, so it's generally going to be zero, zero. Uh, but it could be three-dimensional, or as what four-dimensional or higher. So that's static equilibrium. And the last example we're going to do in vectors is a static equilibrium problem. So a box is suspended, well, a box is suspended from the ceiling. By two cables. as in the diagram, which I will draw, and the box weighs 1,200 pounds. So you definitely don't want it to fall.
and find the tension in the cables. All right, diagram, here's the ceiling, here's the box, and the two cables, there's a 45 degree angle in the front, and a 30 degree angle in the back. You can draw a box if you want, but let me draw a box in a different color. So there's our box. And we do need to draw forces here. So there are two obvious forces. The cables are pulling sort of upwards into the side. So the forces we're going to have, there's one force going this way from that cable and another force going this way for the other cable. And let's call them, I'm using F instead of V for force, where V was mostly standing for velocity before. So we got two forces up here. There is a third force. What is the third force? Gravity. And so gravity, if your building is made correctly, is pulling straight down from the ceiling. So we got this force right here, and we'll call this Fg. So it'll be a force of gravity. So in this diagram, so we need to find magnitude F1 and magnitude F2. So I want to know how strong those forces are. So let's write out all the forces here. Fg is probably the easiest. What are the coordinates for Fg? How much x? Zero. Now the y part, we have to read the problem again. How much is gravity pulling down? Thousand two hundred. Whoa. What's wrong with what I wrote here for FG? Yeah, this would be gravity pushing it towards the ceiling. Which would make all the F one and F two point the other direction to keep it from hitting the ceiling. They certainly wouldn't be cables at that point. All right, so that's FG. Now we're gonna go, we'll go F1 first and F2, just the order I wrote them. Do we know the magnitudes of F1 and F2? That's what we're trying to find. So I don't know their magnitudes. What do I know about F1 and F2? Well, they got to cancel out a 1,200 straight down force. But what, uh, forget about FG, what do I know about these two forces? I know their angles. So let's carefully write out their angles. They're not both 35 and 40. So here is a x-axis right here, how we should be measuring angles. So I'm going to call this theta 1. What is theta 1's measurement? 45. So that comes from that angle being the same as that angle right there. So they're, I don't know, opposite angles on parallel lines, something like that. The other angle is a little bit more tricky. This is how we should be measuring theta 2. And we'll write the value over here on the left. How do I get theta 2? Or maybe a better way to think about it. What is the angle over here on the left? That's 30. So 30 is the complementary angle to the one we want.
So our angle plus 30 is 180. So you can tell theta 2 is 150. And go another 30 and you have 180. So any questions on getting theta 2? What's that? Yeah, so 30. So 180 is, is a flat angle, or to the negative x-axis. Uh, so theta 2 is measured from the positive x-axis over to here. So theta 2, maybe it's time to use a different color. There's theta 2 right there. So theta 2 plus 30. Because we have to measure the angles the same way you measure everything else. So the measurements were given sort of relative, like, hey, that's 30 up there in the corner, but that's not the angle the way we should measure the angle. All right, so we got as much information as we can. We can write out these vectors. So the way we're going to write it, we're writing them R cos theta sine theta, but the problem is I don't know r, so what I'm going to do is just write in magnitude f1. Or maybe another way to do it, that's going to be a lot of extra writing, let's just call it r1. So I don't know r1, but we'll figure out what number is r1 later. That'll be a little less writing. So we got cos theta or cos, make sure we get this right. Cos 150. And then F2, I don't know the radius or the magnitude, so I'll just leave it as another variable, R2. But I do know the angle, cos 30, sine 30. Whoa, something's wrong. 45, that's what's wrong. So we have all three vectors right here. Go ahead and evaluate cosine and sine and get their values right here. Oh, it's time to go. Time flies when you're doing vectors. So I have to unfortunately leave you in the middle of this problem. But what we're going to do is add all three vectors up, set it equal to zero.